All right, so it's Master Tim here. Um, we're going to talk about exercise and your body. So let's go ahead and get right into this. So exercise, what is it? Uh, in most cases, and in I guess the, within the industry throughout, it's just getting up and moving or lifting weights, doing some sort of movement. Um, so as you'll see, I I I kind of I kind of question that. Does it matter if you can do a thousand curls, for instance? Because a lot of uh, fitness is bravado. Like I can do this much, or I can do that many uh, things like that. So, does it really matter what we can do? And you find that the the answer is no. And what is more important, not necessarily what you can do, but how you do it. And that's really what we're going to be focused on today. Um, if you guys have all seen Anchorman, you you know this picture here, Ron Burgundy, where he's, I think he got in like five reps and, uh, you know, was bragging to his, the girl he liked that he can do a thousand. So, machismo there. Um, so, how complex can exercise be? Well, if you guys are familiar with Family Guy, Peter Griffin has it down. So, I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, share my screen Okay, um, Peter's going to show us uh, what's going on here. Hopefully. Let's see, let's try this. All right, boys, now watch out. This is, the key is to put it all in your groin and your back. Take your legs totally out of the equation. Lift with your lower back in a jerking, twisting motion. Ah! Hey, oh, my God. Call an ambulance. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, <laughs> could you see that, Aaron? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So obviously that's an oversimplified version of what I feel you find out in, in the industry. So we're going to set the, the matter straight today. So exercise is not rocket science, right? Well, considering that all exercise is governed by physical laws, which is biomechanics, exercise, and, and that's what rocket science is based off of, exercise really is closer to rocket science than most people think it is. Um, I'm, I'm doing a little stretch there, but you understand what I'm saying. So are, are all types of exercise resistance training? So I'm actually, think about this, like think about uh, going for a jog. Is that resistance training? Now, if you want, throw up a flag if you have something to say about that. No, oh, there we go. I knew, I knew Ben would do it. Go ahead, Ben. I have a great deal of resistance to running. <laughs> now, what, what, um, as I, I would tend to think that resistance, like, I, I don't know if it's just that the Bowflex terminology, but that there's that, I mean, do you, do you really consider gravity resistance? Absolutely. And that's what the whole point of, of this statement is. Think about it, uh, Think about it this way, uh, running on the earth versus the moon, right? Now, I always get some smart ass who says, well, in the moon, you can't breathe, so you wouldn't be able to go very far. Well, okay, I get it. Let's <laughs> let's pretend here for a minute, right? Um, if you, Ben, went for a walk, or I mean, I'm sorry, for a jog on, on the earth, how far do you think you could make it? Um, uh, I couple of houses okay <laughs> so you know a couple like, a block or two, or two right houses. okay yeah. now think about it on the moon how far could you make it again you have an oxygen tank on you're fine oh i'd probably be one all day yeah so you might even be able to make it around the entire moon right a lot further what is the difference um the the, the of gravity the, right you know, which the, is not very Way much. Left. Yes. Okay. So you, you don't have very much resistance going on there. So when it comes down to it, all type of exercise is resistance training. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Okay, Ben? 
Okay. <laughs> Everybody always tells me shut up. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So, <clears throat> running our first moon. So, what provides the resistance for cardio? Again, as Ben mentioned, it, it is the gravity. So, what is exercise? Exercise is the body appropriately challenged. Now, I have a client that I just recently started this week, as a matter of fact, and we were going over um, reverse lunges. So, if you're standing straight up on the ground, you reach, say, one leg back, and you're, and, uh, you're bending the, the leg that stays in front of you, a reverse lunge, okay? So, Typically, when you think of this exercise, you think of somebody going all the way down, maybe even touching their back knee to the ground and then returning to the standing position. Well, that's why appropriately here is is uh, in uh, well capitals because anything really is exercise. I don't care what what it is. It, it even sitting down can be exercise if you're uh, practicing um, good posture. So what Kit had to do is he couldn't control that much range of motion. So we literally started out with, if you can see my hands here, from a standing position, he only moved back about that far because that's all the further his knee could handle and, and get up in a, uh, to the return to a standing position under control. Um, so for him, that was an exercise. For most people looking at that, they say, well, that's not an exercise. He only went four inches down it's it's not an exercise uh it's not the way to look at it what we did is we took an exercise and we adapted it to his body which is you know really what we're talking about here so it's exercise is the body of not just challenged but appropriately challenged so exercise is not learning a list of exercises and their techniques a choreography if you will um, like take Ben's, uh, for Ben, for example, he has a bow flex in there is a list of exercises with two pictures, one starting position and one finished position, and then a, a description of how to get from point A to point B. Um, that if we went based, um, based our exercises on that solely, then we're missing a lot of stuff. And, and that exercise description doesn't really know you very well. It doesn't know you at all. As a matter of fact. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, Chris here, Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you think you and I have the same exact body structure and body type? No. Right. Okay. So if I were to tell you, this is how I do an exercise. Do you necessarily think that's exactly how you should do it? No, not necessarily. Right. Okay. It, it could be a, a starting guide, right? Sure. Okay, so this is how we do an exercise. Here's what what it's working. But beyond that, we have to adapt the exercise to you. So we can't just lean on a predetermined choreograph of exercises. Okay, make sense? Yes. All right, man. All right. So, uh, for example, bench press. This I got out of my National Strength and Conditioning Association book, which if uh, is almost like an exercise uh bible if you will they say here's how they describe how to do a bench press hands shoulder width lower the bar to chest uh and then press to full extension now they're missing a lot of stuff in between there the a squat is the, is described as feet shoulder width descend until thighs are parallel which how are you really supposed to know that and then lift back to starting position well what happened to everything in between there's a lot of stuff in between. Does anybody disagree with that? If so, raise a flag. All right. So we're all in agreement. Um, so for example, I in my master's degree, if you guys don't know, that's why I call myself Master Tim because if PhDs can call, call themselves doctors and I, I can call myself master. Um, so I wrote a three page paper on just one dimension of a proper squat mechanic. If you think about uh, watching somebody squat from the side, so you're seeing like say their left arm and left leg. I wrote three pages on just that right there. I could have wrote probably another three or four, four pages if you looked at the squat going from the front where you're seeing the front side. Uh, probably could have wrote another few pages if you're looking from the top down. 
Um, so there's a lot going on on exercises, more than just what we see in, in a typical exercise description. Again, which is why in the uh, exercise uh, videos that I make, the analysis analysis videos, those are still somewhat incomplete, but I try to get more detailed with those than a typical um, exercise choreograph, if you will, uh, description. So uh, I got a good example here of, of um, what not to do when, when you're curling here. So hold on, I'll share the screen again. And hopefully this turns out. It's going to be kind of sideways, I think. But you get the deal, the idea. Okay, so that uh, anybody have a disagree that that's probably not a good way to do a, a curl? <laughs> All right, so here are some more bad examples, and these are ones I found in a gym, actually made by Nautilus. Um, I'm gonna un unmute you guys here real quick. Okay, can you guys all hear me? Yes. All right. So, um, uh, Maggie. Yes. There? Okay. I am. All right. Does this exercise look like it's done with one hand or two hands to you? Right through here. Well, there's two arms. I can see the two arms, but they're only doing it with one. Okay. So, if you were to get on here, and you're a, a novice lifter, right? Right. If you were to get on here and look at this, would you know exactly how to do this exercise? No. Right. I wouldn't even do it because you wouldn't let me. <laughs> what? Hey, hey. <laughs> I know where I'm at. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the thing is, and here the th here's the thing. This exercise that I, this uh, machine that I took this picture off of is actually done with two arms at a time. So I can really? tell you, yeah, I've had, uh, I've seen people, I, don't, I can't even, if I had a, a dollar for every time I saw this, I'd be rich. People get on here and they they look at this description, they kind of read it, and then they do it one arm because that's what the picture looks like, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not exactly how the machine was meant to be used. Right. Uh, it also right. looks like the one hand. Hey, Tim. Uh, Tim. Go ahead, Ben. Um, I'm looking at this diagram, and one thing, and just based on, on Mike's novice experience, learning weight training um the, the, our current curl movement bar i'll put as far as possible pause in position return slowly uh okay well you return it slowly but you're supposed to like jerk it and pull it up real fast <laughs> exactly right what there's there's that whole missing i mean could, couldn't somebody doing thing. that hurt themselves Oh, yeah. This is the same machine. Well, a very similar machine of, as that video that I showed you guys. So the guy obviously, I mean, he got the jerking up real fast, but didn't get the uh, return slowly to starting position thing, right? Right. So, uh, Aaron, you were going to say something? Uh, no. Oh, okay. not anymore. Okay. <laughs> So here's another example. Uh, does anybody does anybody's shoulder hurt looking at this? Yes. No. Yeah. Because yes. that mine mine throbs just looking at that. Obviously not not the way to do it. So again, um, we can't necessarily go based on diagrams, uh, horrible diagrams, or based on decisions here. Okay. So now, anybody want to point out what's wrong with this picture? Should be both hands together. It would look that way, huh? It looks like uh, you pull um, one side than the other, like like you're running. It, it kind of looks that way, especially like look at this part right here. It looks like he's reaching oh, underneath yeah. this thing to grab that. Right. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. So the description is place feet on footrest, lean forward, grasp handles. Okay. Now here's another thing too: is this guy is grabbing the handles upside down in this picture. <laughs> They're supposed to be the other way. Uh, so uh, pull handles to torso while keeping the torso <laughs> vertical. Okay, so now 
pull handles towards torso. Okay, I get this, but what happens is people think about, uh, and Maggie, you should be familiar with this, is right. people want to pull this back as far as they can, so they take their body and then they lean back right. as far as they can because they're concerned about this getting down. Um, and then ret- again, Ben, return slowly to starting position, but jerk it towards you, right? As hard as you can and as fast as you can. Right. And and then you don't then, get you don't get the real full impact of the exercise if you don't see that. Yeah, yeah. In, in impact is exactly <laughs> what we want. All right. So again, as we can see, exercise is not just simply moving. You can't just get up and start moving. I'm mean, walking, sure, but you know what? There, I have clients that have a hard time walking, so we have to figure out an easier way for them to do it. Um, so. Exercise, as we found out, has really no ideal performance or protocol. And what I mean by that is there's no one size fits all. Um, We have to adapt all the exercises we do to fit uh, our particular structure and our abilities, which I think I talk about here. So each and every exercise must be modified based on your individual goals, structure, current abilities. So, for example, um, the goals thing is important because sometimes you might have to violate things in order to get to your goal. This is what CrossFit is all about, okay? CrossFit is, yeah, are you gonna lose fat, gain some muscle, sure. But your joints and your your muscles are gonna have, or uh, tendons, a toll is gonna be taken on them. But you know what, you made the sacrifice because you wanna be good at CrossFit team, which is a sport, that's what it is. So sometimes the goal will precede, or, uh, not necessarily Trump, but it'll it'll make it so you you uh, are okay, if you will, with um, not having such a minimal risk. Does that does that make sense, guys? Yeah, kind of like baseball pitcher. Yep. Like yep. And pitcher yeah, and, sacrifice his shoulder to have a good career, but he knows at the end of his career, shoulder shot. Right. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. And, and that's why cro- CrossFit really is no different than that. <laughs> All right. So, again, uh, we, the idea is to maximize results and minimize injury. And, and really what it comes down to is we've got to respect our joints because if you don't, uh, take me, for example. I played football, uh, basketball. I've had three knee surgeries. My knee is not all that great. There's going to be a time where I can't do a lot of different exercises because of it. Um, Again, because it was a sport that I love so much, I'm okay with that. But if it was just me trying to get healthy and that happened to my joints, I'm not okay with that. Make sense? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. All right. So, again, here's a good example. Women uh, a lot of times have this little Q angle thing, right? Do you guys see that? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So this part of the joint right here, the point that gets a lot of pressure and this side of the joint doesn't get much. So for instance, doing a squat, what we could do is we could push out a little bit on the feet and what's going to happen is that's going to push this out a little bit and that's going to even the surface. Now this guy over here doesn't necessarily have to do that because his structure is already set for that. So again, it comes down to respecting the joints and modifying the exercises to fit our structure. So again, go ahead. Um, I heard from someone that the greater your your Q angle, the greater the chance that you'll have IT band issues. Is that true? Uh, I, you know, honestly, Aaron, I don't really know. You know, the IT band, for those of you that don't know, attaches from here and goes down here. And typically, um, a lot of the swelling and stuff happens right here. I guess it could be right because this right here may be uh, pushing and rubbing against it. I um, There's a lot of issues with what causes IT band uh, syndrome, and uh, much of it is due to overuse. Um, now, is this going to cause more of that? I don't know because it's on the side of this whole thing. Now, I could see it saying right here, there's a ligament in there called a medial collateral ligament that's really being strained to keep this thing from further going this way. I could see that for sure. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. 
Okay. Um, I haven't sure. researched it and, and just looking at it mechanically doesn't necessarily make sense to me, but maybe there's research that supports it. I don't know. Okay, so exercise is also not about all about the ass kicking. Uh, anybody here a fan of The Biggest Loser? No. Good. <laughs> I've seen um, it. What's that? I've seen it, but I'm not a fan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan either. In fact, the uh, biggest loser tends to be a thorn in my side because I get people come up to me saying, I want you to train me like Jillian. Um, I need to lose 15 pounds a week or more. If I lose five pounds, then uh, it's an unsuccessful week. So that's why I don't like it. These two guys, you guys remember these? If you can see it very well, uh, these two guys were brothers. They were cops from Oklahoma City. All right. Well, anyhow, that's that's who they are. Okay. Okay. So these guys went on the show, and they needed to lose some weight. Obviously, uh, one of them got kicked off fairly early, and another one made it. Uh, you know, till uh, there was only like four or five people left. Well, they went back to Oklahoma City, and as a result of the show, both of them needed knee surgery. Um, sure, they had lost some weight, but knee surgery was in their future. Now they happened to meet Tom Purvis, the guy that I learned all my biomechanics stuff from and got trained by them. And they were able to lose an extra hundred pounds and avoided knee surgery because again, they, what they started doing is adapting the exercises towards them. And here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing. A little background is anytime they, uh, their weight, stopped going down what they wanted to do can anybody guess what they wanted to do with their calories Cut them. Yes. exactly they wanted to decrease so they were eating around 800 calories a day aaron is there a problem with that yeah <laughs> okay so what tom did is he actually increased their calories and uh, chris you there yes all right what do you what do you think happened when they increased their calories I'm going to guess they lost weight. They did. Yay. <laughs> um, so, yes, that is exactly what happened. But it's because they ate more balanced food. Um, yeah. And they didn't do – they did cardio, but they didn't do a ton of cardio. Most of their uh, – they did cardio or lardio, I guess, um, strategically. This guy here, Jerry Skibeck, he tore his hamstring during the show. Nobody knew about it. And uh, he complained about it, but what do you think they told him? Work out harder. Yeah, work out harder. Tough, you know, work through the pain. No pain, no gain kind of thing, right? So, again, that's also what a lot of um, um, oh, what's the, the CrossFit is all about, too. So, is exercise invasive? Can exercise affect you from the inside? Anybody have an answer to that? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what we're trying to get it to affect. When you put a dumbbell in your hand. Who's that? Airplane. Ah, okay. So when you put a dumbbell in your hand, it's not making your hand stronger or the, you know, the, the skin on your hand uh, stronger. Although I guess you could argue that with a callus, right? Um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to affect a muscle that's inside your skin and it also in turn affects the joints because the joints are all about i'm sorry the muscles are all about controlling the joints think about icing your ankle anybody here ever uh sprained an ankle yeah yeah ben did you have a question no i was just going to mention in the previous slide when you talk about increasing cal actually i i, I can testify firsthand to that because when I started working with Erin, um, she had me damn near close to double my calor my calorie intake and I thought she was totally insane. I'm like, <laughs> I'm I'm eating okay and stuff, right? You know, and I'm trying yeah. not to snack too much and she's like, No, if you don't if you don't have if you don't have the fuel, your body can't do the work it's supposed to do and and I was, and I had plateaued, and so I increased my calorie intake, and bang! I, it, you know, it's like my body kicked into gear, and yep, 
Nice. Uh, I, um, I can tell you firsthand it, it works. Yep. Yep. Um, so as far as exercise being invasive, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take outside forces that generate internal forces with our muscles that, that in turn, uh, cause our body to change. Think about ice in your ankle. When you sprain your ankle, you don't put ice on it so that it makes your skin cold, right? You're trying to ice your ankle so, so that it gets in the coldness gets inside the joint and, um, you know, reduces the histamine and, and, and the pain, especially, so that you can recover fast. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, watch this uh, video here, guys, if it works. I think it should work. All right, what I might have to do is do another little sc screen share here. Let me pop it up first. Okay. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear that? We're looking in this left shoulder. Yeah. Uh, we're looking from the back to the front, from posterior to anterior. This needle's coming in the front of your shoulder, just above the biceps tendon. This is the bicep. Whoops. Biceps right here. It attaches to the top of the glenoid via this big labrum or cartilage, which is quite irregular and ragged here. You've got a lot of redundancy in this cartilage that's sort of being frayed here. Now this is your humeral head to the left. The glenoid or the socket is down here below. One thing I want to show you here is you've got quite a bit of arthritis in this shoulder. A normal shoulder should be nice and smooth and pristine, sort of like this small area right here. And you can see down here the glenoid is very rough, very uh, cobblestony down in here. You can see the yellowish degeneration on the glenoid, how rough it is, and then look on the humeral head. See here, as I rotate the humeral head, you've got a huge, huge area of arthritis there. As I spin your arm around, see it's down to bone right there. So Jerry, this is a bad, bad problem because you've rubbed down to rough bone on your humeral head. This doesn't even have anything to do with your rotator cuff. It's just due to abuse of the shoulder over many, many years from your weightlifting and your training. Uh, so regrettably, we can't do a thing about that just raw bone rubbing on the glenoid you can see as I rub it back and forth uh, we can't resurface that at all now you do have a lot of debris in this shoulder that we're going to clean up I'm going to polish this cartilage tear up in here <clears throat> I'm going to trim the cartilage down here in fairly as well we'll put a shaver in and tidy this up but you can see that this shoulder has just realized too many miles too much stress over the years because this is the worst part of it right here the no matter what we do to your rotator cuff, you're going to have achy, deep, achy pain in the shoulder every day of your life because of this uh, bone bone rubbing on joint surface. Now, the rotator cuff is a whole different problem unrelated to your arthritis. This is the rotator cuff here. You can see the blood supply stops right here. Normally, the rotator cuff attaches to the humerus right here. See how the articular cartilage stops? The rotator cuff should attach all back and look what happens the rotator cuff stops right here then you have a big space of empty bone sort of looks like the surface of the moon here that's where your rotator cuff should be attached is right across here where my needle is but the undersurface of the rotator cuff is torn and retracted sort of like a rubber band right back up in here see here's the edge of the rotator cuff right here see how thick it is this is what we call the rotator cuff cable because there's a Crescentic cable 
the rotator cuff that goes all the way from here all the way back to the back. And you can see you just have a big defect here, but it's still under surface. It's not through and through. But see this big leathery uh, cardboard-like wad of rotator cuff. This here should be attached to the bone right here. Okay, now look in the background. You've got a nice surface of rotator cuff on top of that. And that's why your arthrogram dye did not leak out all the way through and why our fluid's not leaking all the way through. So it's still an incomplete tear, uh, but it's not, you know, I mean, this shoulder's just not looking good, Jerry. I mean, we can only do so much to, to improve a beat up shoulder, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to give you the relief you want to get back to training and weightlifting. This is a shoulder that should not be weightlifting. Wow. Okay. So, what uh, what was the cause of that? Weightlifting. Right. Okay. And it's in particular, in proper weightlifting. Now, was there anything that they could do for him? Not much. Right. Right. They might be able to give him some pain meds, but it's not going to fix the issue. And here's where it becomes real important, guys is it isn't necessarily the uh, acute, the acute injuries that um, that we need to worry about it's it's more the uh, long-term injuries that uh, like like arthritis that happen that that are the big deal now when someone gets arthritis or you're developing arthritis you don't you don't know it until it's too late so for instance, the the uh, the cartilage that you guys see right here doesn't have any pain receptors. Um, doesn't have any pain receptors, so you don't know what you're doing until it's gone. Okay, so those are that's why we need to respect our joints before these things happen. Okay. By the way, you guys are all muted again because someone was making much noise. Stop it. Um, so if you have a question, raise a flag. Okay, so that's a shoulder example. Stretching, same thing. Um, you know, people think, oh, you got to stretch to elongate your muscles. Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to get our joints to get in a position that our muscles don't want us to, to get to go to. It's not that our muscles can't get there, because if you put somebody under anesthesia like this guy, you could turn yourself into a pretzel. No problem. The muscle will go there. It just doesn't want to. And so it's trying to protect something, and typically it's trying to protect our joints. Uh, so here's an example. You guys probably saw this on my Facebook page not too long ago, but you guys see this this um, hand right here. This represents your shoulder, okay? And this re represents your muscle pulling. It's closer to the joint. And this represents a weight in your hand, okay? Now this guy was pulling with 20 pounds or i'm sorry this guy was pulling with five pounds of force so this guy's being four well basically uh two feet versus six inches. so he's got four times the mechanical advantage which happened to be 20 pounds uh i'm sorry 20 pounds here five pounds of resistance so it's like holding a five pound dumbbell in your hand which creates 15 pounds of joint force right here this guy if you were there in person had a really hard time holding that in position and every time I do this example, they have a really hard time. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to cheat by uh, using his other hand or something like that. And I made it so he couldn't. Um, now, again, this is just a, a, an example of a static weight, not moving, holding straight out from your shoulder. And it's 15 pounds. And this guy had a hard time holding it in place. Imagine holding something like 20 pounds, especially when it starts moving. The amount of joint forces that happen here are astronomical. If you take five pounds and you... You uh, swing it above your head and then try to catch it on the way down. You're probably talking a good few hundred pounds of joint force here. Again, to me, that does a couple of things. It gives me great respect for the strength and the structure of the structure of the body, but also lets me know that we really need to be careful. Even though we might be holding a light weight in our hands, there's a lot of forces going on there. So who has control over everything that's going on here? Is it your workout partner? Is it... Uh, your trainer, which kind of has some responsibility for it, in my opinion, because I am one. Is it exercise gurus, muscle and fiction magazines? Really what it comes down to is you. You are responsible for this. Um, 
if you are doing something that doesn't feel right or or you're not trying to again the re whole reason why we're here is so that we can get educated so that we know what to do when we're working out on our own because um you know even maggie we're, yes. we're, we're working out together but how often how often excuse me how often am i with you on a weekly basis close to once a week okay so once a week and uh how for how long half an hour okay so how many other days and and how much more time are you working out on your own um two to three times okay a so week. a lot more a lot more than you're with me right right okay so that's why we're here is because we're trying to get educated so that we know when we're on our own even if we do have a trainer we're doing things right and so that's right. that's what the whole point of these webinars are for okay so what's the end goal again what we're all doing here is we want to increase our overall health and wellness and be free from disease so basically what that means we want to enjoy life how do we do this? Well, we do have to exercise, but the idea and the goal is to minimize the risk and maximize the benefit. There's now having said that, there is always going to be some risk. Even walking has risk, some more for others, um, more for some than others. Uh, for instance, there's a risk in twisting your ankle, which I've done on little pebbles. Um, there's a risk in it doing it too much and it gives you plantar fasciitis. There's, there's no such thing as a risk free exercise, but what we need to do is understand what the exercise is and what it's doing to us on the inside to minimize that risk and also maximize the, uh, the benefit. Okay. So everybody with me, raise a flag if you're not, or if you have a question. Okay, so are machines the answer? I really like machines because um, I don't know, they're just really useful and they're less intimidating for most people, especially when uh, when they've been instructed how to use it. Now, again, they will determine your path of motion. The machine typically will only do one thing. And here's the problem is people think because it, has only a single path of motion that we can't screw it up, which is totally wrong. Uh, Maggie, I'm going to unmute you again. So okay. we've been we've been working together on the machines. Um, you know, would you say that your knowledge for other, or I guess your respect for the machines has changed as far as how you use it? I really um, try to remember all the little tips that you give me on how to sit, how to get ready before I even do it. I, I have my little checklist in my head of how to do what I need to do so I don't hurt myself. Right, right. So um, it, really what comes down to is there you don't just get on it and start pushing and pulling, right? You got to set everything up. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you this because we've been working one-on-one -on -one together. Can you work muscles that you're not even intending to work on a machine? Absolutely. Yeah. So, for instance, on a, on this uh, seated row, you know, I showed her how you can actually work your bicep more than your back, even though it's meant to target your back. Um, so, are they the answer? No, because you can still be pushing, pulling on different directions on the handle, which is and change the in, the uh, external force in the direction of it, and it could potentially create bigger moments, which is basically more force to our joints. So, right. don't just think you're okay by hopping on a machine. That's the whole point of that. So here's what you need to know from all this thing. It's the need to know list, and yes, you are on it. Um, never violate your joints' capabilities. So, for example, on a preacher curl, yeah, I'm gonna hope you guys can see me here. Think about it this way: you're you're coming down on a on a curl here, right? Now this force is trying to take your hand and basically bend your elbow in a direction it doesn't want to go or shouldn't be going okay now think about a traffic extension uh, on a machine the same way you're coming out like this now in this instance it's different the position is the same the forces are different okay think about having your arms straight out and one's trying to bend your elbow backwards and one's trying to take you one force is trying to take you out of that position okay so 
What that means is one is safe and one is not safe. It isn't the position that matters. It's how the force interact uh, and affect those joints. So um, does that make sense to everybody? Raise a flag if you got a, you got a question about that. All right. So never go beyond your current capabilities. Again, taking that example with Kit, my, uh, my client, where we had to take an exercise that's typically done a certain way and and uh, make it or adapt it to her, his capabilities. I take, for example, a one-legged squat versus two. Most people, not everybody, can do a two-legged squat, but doing a one-legged squat requires a great deal of strength and balance and, and all that. And again, I gave you the example of Kit for the lunge depth. Um, a biggie is, is balance training, getting on something that uh, you're trying to increase your balance, so you're getting on an unstable object to to challenge that. Really, what it comes down to is that, and this is uh, this could be a whole different webinar here, but what you're standing on a balance board doesn't challenge um, or or create balance. It demands it. It means you already have to have it. Uh, so there's an example of of something that could potentially cause some problems. Also. Getting on an unstable pro uh, object will also reduce the uh, the force output that our muscles are capable of producing, which again is going to lower strength. And and for most people, or for I guess I can say everybody, strength is going to be a, a, an important thing. So rotate your tires. What this means is if you're doing a bench press in one plane of motion, it's probably like say straight. It's probably a good idea to mix in uh, some sort of incline or some sort of decline, not just because you're trying to hit different, uh, focus on different parts of your muscle, which is very, very hard to do, by the way. Um, but what you're doing is you're changing the, the path of the wear and tear within your joint. It's like rotating your tires. So what that's going to do is it's, it's, it's going to make your joints last longer. So again, exercise should be directed towards reaching your goals. But again, while... Um, while respecting your joints. So again, that whole thing is just maximizing the benefit, which is again, reach, getting you from point A to point B as quickly and safely as possible. So again, thank you for, for being here. Um, we're gonna open it up to some Q&A now. So let me go here and unmute. All right, so everybody's unmuted. Any questions about what we discussed? Yeah, what's, <clears throat> so, so, I mean, I've never done them, and, and you and I have never discussed them. So what's the deal about preacher curls? Are they, they just bad? or, or No, they're not bad. What I'm, what I'm saying is, is if you think, think about um, having from your elbow to your shoulder uh, hanging or sitting on like a ledge, and the rest of your arm is hanging off that ledge, okay? Right. Now you put a 50-pound dumbbell in your hand with your arm straight. Okay, is that going to feel very good? It's going to, yeah, I can see it's going to stress that elbow. Right, absolutely. Now, think about it this way. Someone puts a string in your hand or, say, um, a resistance band pulling up on your hand in the same position. Now, is there any issues there? Um, well, it's wanting to pull my arm in the position my elbow is wanting to go. Right, exactly. It's what it is. Trying to put your arm in and get your elbow to do what it's actually built for. So what I'm saying is, is in that position, you have to be careful how the forces are affecting the joints. So on a preacher curl, you may not want to go fully extended. Whereas on a tricep machine, which is doing what that string example was, uh, it's okay because it's not trying to put your joint into a position it can't go. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. So don't go. That, okay. Because yeah, there are there are a lot of exercises I do that you said, and that my book says don't don't fully extend. Don't yep. Lock, yeah. don't lock your joint straight. Mm -hmm. And and if the force is trying to take, if you're in a locked position, and your force is trying to take you further into that locked position. Probably a bad idea. If the force is trying to take you out of that locked position, you should be okay. All right. I, okay. I understand. Totally so what I'm, yeah, because the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of people will say, don't go in a locked position because it's bad. Well, 
it's what do you mean? It's based on context. It's based on what's what are the, what are the forces doing in that position. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Tim, is there any difference in working on like a bow flex machine versus a static machine? I mean, obviously, I know that there's a difference in you know mobility and the exercise itself, but as far as safety is concerned. Is there anything to be more or less concerned about with a bow flex? Okay, so when you say a static machine, can you just so I have all my information right? Can you explain that? Like a press machine that's just a machine you're pushing, you know, pushing out away from you, uh -huh. um, with the plates that type, like a Nautilus machine. Yeah, versus a bow flex. Sure. Okay, and so you're saying the difference as far as safety is concerned? Yeah. Is there anything? more or less safe about either one of them uh yeah the uh the biggest thing that pops in my head is is this is inertia um with a bow flex you know you're talking uh power rods or if you got a revo and you're dealing with the spiral flex which both are have no inertia so think about it this way um which machine do you have a bow flex chris yeah i have the ultimate the ultimate okay yep so no matter how fast you move that weight, you're getting the same resistance the entire time. You can move it one mile an hour. You can move it 20 miles an hour. It's not changing anything other than how fast you're moving, how fast your muscle fibers are twitching. Okay. On a machine, let's say, uh, you know, a barbell or even just a Nautilus machine, the faster you move that thing, the faster the weights, which are controlled by gravity as far as you know their resistance the faster they're moving and what that's going to do is that's going to increase the inertia and when the inertia like for instance if you push out real fast and that weight stack say jumps up real fast and then it slams down and you have to catch that you're not dealing with 20 pounds you're dealing with 20 times whatever the inertia is and it, it, and it increases exponentially so for example 20 pounds moves five miles an hour, just for example, and, and this uh, calculation isn't accurate, it might create 150 pounds of force okay, at five miles an hour. You take that same weight and you move it 10 miles an hour, which is twice as fast, you're not getting 300 pounds of, of force. You're now getting 600 pounds of force. Um, so again, it's that starting popping of that inertia that, that creates the bigger danger. That's gotcha. the biggest thing, Chris. Um, so yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm, no problem. Any other questions? Oh, I forgot. I did, but I just forgot. I just dropped <laughs> blank. Aaron, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Okay. Oh, speed. Um, and, and, and when working out, what about speed? How important is how fast you, you move through your exercise? Um, well, as in the example I gave with Chris, you know, if you're using free weights, it's it's really important because of the whole inertia thing, right? Um, on a bow flex. On a bow flex. Now, here's the thing. This is why I like bow flex better if you're trying to increase, um, like, your power or um, your speed of movement. So, for instance... Um, if you're trying to get your muscle to fire faster because you can really push fast as hard as you can and as quickly as you can on that thing and again you're only dealing with the weight that the machine put the the uh, rods are putting out or uh in the case of like kaiser equipment the hydraulics um which will allow you to you know your muscle will in fact learn how to produce force faster because of that now um Speaking of that, now, for instance, take, take a max lift. Uh, for, for instance, take a max bench press. When you're maxing out, you're not moving very fast. Am I right? Right. Okay, but your muscles are twitching extremely fast. And what that means is even though you're not moving fast, the muscle fiber is twitching and getting to this thing called tetanus super duper fast. And even though it's, uh, again, the speed isn't all that fast, your muscles are learning how to... Uh, Twitch faster, making you a quicker human being, if you will. Again, your genetics are going to have a lot to do with that, too. So a lot of times for sports conditioning, that might be a, a, a way to train. But 
what I say, as far as normal folks, like, like all of us, I think, um, we want to go only as fast as we can control, which is, I, I guess, I think probably what you're asking, Ben. Um, so it's okay to go fast, but if you can't control that speed, you, you need to slow it down. Right. Cause I, I stick with the old rule of thumb that, you know, three or four seconds each direction. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing with that. Um, but, I would prefer you not concentrate on actually counting. I don't know if that's what you're doing or if you're just kind of having a sense of that. Cause as soon as you start concentrating on your counting on your time, then you lose focus on the muscles you're trying to actually work. So what? So how how should I at this point be thinking about my speed? Should I just do whatever's comfortable, or yes? Like yep. If I'm comfortable moving a little faster, it's okay. If you're comfortable moving a little faster, absolutely. And I know you got the Bowflex Revolution, so if you want to move fast and you, again you can do that under control, then then great. Here's the thing: is you always always have to be focus on the muscles that you're you're trying to that you're using to to make this movement happen um again if you're moving too fast and and it takes that concentration away you're likely not under control of the exercise right gotcha i understand okay okay anything else uh from you chris or maggie nope i'm good i don't even know what to ask <laughs> <laughs> i i do have i do have one question for aaron Sure. Sure. How 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 good or bad are boiled crawfish <laughs> for our diet? Boiled crawfish? Okay, you probably don't you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> yep. No, I I've, I've had, I know uh, I know what crawfish are. That's fine. It just what do you eat with them though? Butter. What? Yeah. Well, what do you eat? No, them? It's just, it's just, if it's just boiled fish, then it's fine. Yeah, it's just boiled in Zatarain's crab boil. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all about the portion size, right? Uh, about four pounds. Four, four pounds? Okay. It's a full meal. You're eating four yeah. pounds of crawfish? Easy, yeah. So four pounds of anything is probably too much, right? Well, well, you got to realize we're peeling them. That's that's whole crawfish. Oh, we're breaking the head. Okay, we're I see. We're, so we're peeling. Gotcha. We're getting, how much of that is actually meat? Probably. About a pound and a half, maybe. About a pound and a half, maybe, if they're really big and good, but, you know. Now, yeah. now you guys are splitting that so, pound and a half? No veggies, no fruit, nothing else, just crawfish tail. <laughs> so maybe think about balancing it out with some other types of food and uh, pay attention to how you feel, too, if you're if you feel stuff, then that's a good indication that you've had too much. I don't know the calorie breakdown though of crawfish. So. Yeah, now I've, I've, there's, I've heard a debate down here because crawfish is, you know, boiled crawfish is such a staple. Some people say, oh, they're really fatty, and some people say, oh, they're not that fatty. They're pretty good for you. They're seafood, but I don't know. All in how it's cooked. <laughs> Yeah, how it's cooked, and then what else? Um, you know, if you're dipping it or have some sort of sauce or something like that, then that's gonna affect it. I guess we yeah. need to get a box of Zatarain seafood oil and actually look at the ingredients and see what's in there, huh? Yeah, it would be interesting. Would, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I've been eating it twice and I have no clue. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. So, any any other questions? Ken, don't right. forget, I'm going to call you shortly after this is over. Right. Got it. Uh, Chris, you good? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks. All right, no problem. Maggie, you're good. I'm good. All right. Well, guys, thanks for showing up. Um, you know, kind of a rough start, and and uh, 
you know, there's some things we can tweak and make better. But I appreciate you being here. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you, Aaron. Well, Aaron. Thanks a lot to you both. Welcome and have a good night. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.